Well, hey, planner painters, I've got 12 mind blowing tips on how to help you pop your colors on planner oil painting if you're struggling with muddy or flat, boring colors in your paintings. Let's get painting. And uh, if, you, if you watch till the end of the video, you're gonna see how I did the drawing stage, the four P's of the drawing stage. Here we are, ready to do the block in. So I've got that darkest dark color mixed up, an evergreen tree color. I just used phthalo blue, cad yellow medium, and I used a little bit of alizarin crimson. And it, it brought me to this color right here. So I'm gonna dip into my pile of uh, green that we just mixed up here and get those evergreen trees in because they are closest to me and they are my darkest dark. That will help me show atmospheric perspective if I get that value right and if I get that color right. So tip number one here, all right? Here is the secret to vibrant, radiant light in your oil paintings. This is, this is important, is contrast. Really, it's just, it's putting warm colors and cool colors beside each other. And the Impressionists were really the first ones to teach that and accomplish that. But that is your secret to bold, vibrant colors. So if you're not putting warms next to cools and cools next to warms and complementary colors next to complementary colors, if you're not doing that, then this tip will really help you get bolder, vibranter colors in your oil paintings, if you will. So there's my darkest dark. You can see that appearing. I'm just doing a, I'm using a number 12 brush. I'm using a Raphael number 12 that I just brought, uh, bought. I really like this brush so far. Okay, I'm gonna teach you how to pop your colors on a gray day too. So with the sky color, I just mixed up some uh, cerulean blue, a little bit of ultramarine blue and titanium white and a little bit of cad red to get uh, to get that sky color. I'm gonna leave, purposely leave some of the orange underneath that. But you know, back to uh, tip number one with contrast. Um, contrast creates interest in a painting. It really does. If you, if you look at some paintings and the paintings that you love and people love your paintings, it's because you've created interest through contrast, uh, whether you knew it or not. <laughs> it's the secret to bold, vibrant colors in your painting. So you gotta train yourself to look for opportunities to create that, that contrast and that interest in your painting. You know, people will really appreciate that and you will love your paintings and your paintings will improve. So if you're a beginner planner painter, please get that tip number one, that you've got to learn how to create contrast in your painting because it creates interest. We all want interesting paintings. Let's get on to tip number two though. I've got 12 tips to cover. I can't believe it. It's the most amount of tips I've ever done in a video. A little nervous about it because I want to get you great information, but uh, there's just going to be a lot to cover. So uh, I'm going to move fast and furious. But uh, tip number two is if you want to pop your colors in plein air oil painting as a beginner is use colorful darks. Okay, we'll talk more about that. But uh, my point is this, don't just mix up, you know, one dark color and use that for all your darks. You don't want to do that. Shadows do the heavy lifting, but light gets all the credit. You know what that saying means is that if you do your darks, that's why I do my darks and shadows first. If you do those correctly, you know, the light just makes, the light just is so easy and it comes on and it makes the magic happen. That's kind of that point right there. Um, so, you know, there, there is light that gets into the shadows. If you watched my tree painting video, we really covered that in depth. I think a lot of people liked that and got a lot from that, was that there's, there's different planes and different gradients and different things that happen with light. Light does get in the shadow. Reflected light, for example, gets in the shadow, as you know. So don't just make a black, dark, boring uh, shadow color. Those evergreen trees, I'm gonna put some, some pure color in the shadows because I see them and because it's interesting. I'll teach you another little secret about shadows. Try to, try to put the complementary color in the shadow, you know what I mean? So if, if the light portion of your evergreen tree is green, what's the complementary color of green? Red. So put a, put a, a, a purple or a red, a lizard crimson. Sometimes I'll just take a pure lizard crimson and put it in the shadow right there. Well, we're making this video in particular because a subscriber asked. I really do read your comments. I read your emails. Get a hold of me if you want a certain topic. I'd love to help. Here we go. You know, people, people's eyes subconsciously are searching for that. They're, they're searching for that in the shadow. I've seen the studies. I can't quote them. You probably know what I'm talking about. But subconsciously, your brain looks for the complementary color, the opposing color. And then it satisfies the brain. It's really a weird thing. So your brain's looking for it. Your viewer's brain is looking for it. So why don't you just put it there? Help them out. Help their brains out. It's so fun when the weather changes, though, because it cha it's challenging. I like it. You know, like right now I'm doing a how to pop your colors painting and uh, there's no sun, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some tips here coming up that don't really rely on the sun for popping your, your paintings. Tip number three is 
kind of a, a rule that I go by and I don't, I don't, I don't go by too many rules as you know, but it is a, it is kind of a good rule to kind of keep in mind. And that is warm light equals cool shadows, cool light equals warm shadows. Uh, if you if you kind of use that little piece of information, it will help your painting so much. Warm light, cool shadows. When the sun is out, basically, if the light source is warm, like when the sun is out, all the other areas that are in light, all the areas of your painting that are in light, they'll be warmer than the shadow. Now, it sounds kind of common sense. The shadow will be cool, cooler than all your warm pieces in the painting. Sounds like common sense, right? But a lot of people make a mistake there, and they don't keep that in mind. You know, if you make some of your shadows warmer than the light pieces, for example, you've kind of just made a technical mistake that won't read well with people when they view your painting. I'm going to get the evergreen forest in there. That's uh, piece number two, because we just kind of lost it a little bit, which is okay. That happens. Just go back and put it in. It's no biggie. Just like that. A couple few strokes and we we're back in business. But, you know, back to uh, warm light, cool shadows and cool light, warm shadows. So today it's overcast. I don't know which way this painting is going to go. I won't decide until, you know, a little bit later here in the painting. But let's just say it stays overcast. Then everything in the light will be hit by a cool light, right? The light will be cool. So everything that's in the light that I can see in the light will be cool. And therefore, if there are shadows, like on a rainy day, you ever see shadows on a rainy day? You know, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Those shadows will have to be warmer than all the pieces in the cool light. So you might have to rewind that and listen to that, but that's really gonna help you in your paintings if you, if you get that generalized rule. Again, it's not 100%, but uh, it's 98.5%, so it'll help you. Okay. Don't get nervous about it, don't worry about it. Don't try to make a masterpiece, just have fun, man. <laughs> just have fun. It's so fun to just paint with all the colors and just to be up here, I mean, seriously. I'm just using some funky colors, man. I'm using, I'm using lizard crimson. See that stroke is just pure lizard crimson right there. Uh, I'll do it again, just so you can kind of see. But on the on the side of this tree, like that, you know, just because it's fun. <laughs> okay, there's a uh, evergreen forest at the base of this 14,000 foot mountain that I just want to hint and suggest. In Colorado, it's very prevalent. The evergreen forests go up to about 10,000 feet. The tree line, it's called. And so, uh, you know, you can't make a Colorado mountain without, without putting this evergreen forest in. And so the other thing this does, this evergreen forest, is it helps set back and show atmospheric depth for the mountain. Because, as you know from previous videos, everything is darker in the foreground, middle ground, and then lighter in the background and cooler in temperature. Well, hey, if we're just meeting, by the way, my name is Terry, and uh, my passion is plain air painting and enjoying God's beauty outdoors. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button if you're getting value out of this and join us every two weeks for these high mountain plein air adventures where you get tips and techniques to uh, help you make beautiful paintings and uh, hit the like button the thumb and hit the bell icon if you want to be notified every time i make a new video you'll be the first to know about it thanks for joining me here we go let's show you how we we mix up the rock color up on the mountain there i'm going to go into alizarin and crimson put that down just a little bit of that some titanium white i'm going to go into cobalt blue right here and mix up a gray color that leans more on the side of red. Purple, gray color. So I want to use complementary colors there. I'm putting a little bit of orange to gray it down because that's the complementary of violet. And then a little more red because it's like a red burgundy kind of a rock. A little more losing crimson. It's a, it's a darker color. I just don't want to make that value too dark. Again, to show atmospheric perspective, it's the furthest thing from me. I'm going to use palette knife. All right. I carry three of them. I highly suggest you learn how to use them. This is where it gets fun right here. And I could do this with a brush and I will. I'll use a palette knife and a brush. But with all the talking that I did, I just kind of covered up my rock. So I just want to get that back in there. That's why I kind of like palette knives. They're good for rock mountains because they're not, they're not so precise. You know what I mean? And that's how rock is here in the Rocky Mountains seeing nature's colors so if you want to pop your colors i highly recommend that you spend some time even when you're not painting observing and getting good at uh, seeing and mixing colors and i of course i have a video on that seeing and mixing oil colors on plein air see that video if you haven't already i'm going to teach you a tip here that my mentor taught me and he said it to me one day we were out painting and he just kind of said it casually as a matter of fact 
and it was gold. It, it, I have never forgotten what he told me, and I'm about to share it with you right now. And it's just an amazing tip that helped my plein air go to the next level. And so I'm going to share that with you, but I'm really just trying to focus on these mountains here. I mean, you got to chase the light, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to talk, paint, and keep up with the light. You know, first of all, let me just say this before I tell you that, that real special tip um, about seeing colors when you're observing is that, you know, we, we can't we can't replicate God's palette out there in nature, obviously. We all know that, right? So what we have to do as plein air painters is we have to create the illusion, that mood, that feeling through the colors on our on our palette. It seems kind of daunting, but that's your job. You know, your job isn't to make a masterpiece. I mean, that's great if you do, but while you're out painting, your job is to put the right color, value, and temperature in the right place, in the right piece. So that that is why it's tip number four. You know, if you if you don't really try to improve at seeing nature and its colors and the shapes, you're you're gonna struggle with your plein air paintings for a long time. On to this tip that my mentor told me. Sorry, I didn't mean to keep you hanging, but I had to I had to focus here. <laughs> um, basically, when you are trying to look out into nature and you're struggling with seeing the piece, you know, like this, this isn't easy seeing this rock color on a mountain. I'm, I mean, I'm struggling. When you, when you do that, don't, don't look at the very center of an object because you'll be able to convince yourself that it's any color value or temperature if you look right in the middle. Look to the borders, look to the edges, look here and see what it looks like on the border of its neighboring color. Because one of the points here about uh, you know, creating contrast that we talked about earlier is you gotta pay attention to the surrounding color. You gotta step back and you gotta look at it and you gotta look at everything in relation to the other colors that are around it, all right? And uh, so if that, if that doesn't work for you, here's another step. Look away from the scenery and then look back quickly at the piece you're trying to see in nature and just look out of the peripheral of your eye. So I'm, get, I'm trying to get you to not just stare endlessly at a piece and convince yourself that it's some kind of color and struggle with it. Look away and look back quickly and you might be able to catch out of the corner of your eye and peripheral vision. It's happened to me multiple, multiple times, a color I've been searching for and I couldn't quite get. Now, okay, so step number three in that process, if you're still struggling after those two steps, is that you just want to just go on to a different piece. Don't sit there and struggle. And uh, if it just, if it isn't working, come back to it later. You'll get it, it'll, it'll come. So those are, it's a three-step method there for you to to try to help you see your colors in nature better and nail the right color value and temperature in the right place. I'm going to mix up the snow color on the mountain. I'm gonna to try to keep my darks to the left and my lighter values to the right on my palette. And uh, let's go ahead and do that right now. I'm gonna use some titanium white. Uh, I'm gonna use a lot of that today. There's still a great deal of snow on the mountain. Ultramarine blue, just a little hint of it, and a bit of cad red medium to bring up a, a gray neutral um, color for the snow. I want you to see me kind of struggle with it back and forth because, because I think it'll help you see how I, how I make my way through it and I will make my way through it and I will find the right color. It's my job, it's my mission. That's why I'm here. That's why I came here. I also came here to have fun. <laughs> Sometimes just being spontaneous and not overthinking it can really help you in a painting. Yeah, that's it right there. It's a grayish red. But this color, this little subtle brush stroke right there can really add a lot of interest and meaning to my painting. Okay, tip number five, we're going commando. Here's what we got so far with the palette and uh, just give you a close up, but I want to show you something about tip number five here out on the trees. So I grabbed the camera off the stand. See those evergreens right there? So tip number five is your core dark. Um, go back and watch that tree painting video I did if you're interested, but every dark pretty much, again, no rules, 100%, but every dark has what's called a core dark. So when you look at colors, they're gonna have on the right side of that tree, there'll be the light hitting it. And then the very left side of the tree right there is what we call a core dark at the bottom. See it? Okay, let's go back to my painting real quick. The core dark is gonna be right here in the trees where the light doesn't get in, okay? So I just wanted to kind of point that out in the scenery 
And let's go back to the canvas here and look at how we do that. Okay, so the thing about a core dark, in order to make your colors pop when you're painting oil painting on plein air, is always include a core dark, first of all, because it's gonna create contrast and interest in your painting. But when you do that, use a spot of pure color. For example, let's go into uh, oh, ultramarine blue right here, okay? Put a spot of pure color like that, ultramarine blue, unmixed. There's a little titanium white in there by accident, but unmixed in your core dark right there. Just, just a little, just a little, I'll cover some of that up, but just like that. See how that creates interest? See how that makes my colors pop? Now I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna leave it like that, but if you do that with pure color, I know that might be scary for some and you may not consider yourself a colorist or an impressionist and that's okay. Try a little dab, like even if you just, a little, little dab. Subconsciously, you know, people might not be able to see it in your painting right away, but their mind will read it and be like, oh, there's something interesting going on in his shadows. What is it? So that's tip number five, core dark. And in your core dark, use a spot of pure color. Man, I like that tip. I hope that helps you. All right, I've made a crucial, important decision here. I am going to chase the light. I am going to put some light in this painting. The, the day has been kind of overcast, and it's been sunny, and that's how it happens in the mountains. But eventually, as you go along here, you got to make a decision. I'm mixing up some cad yellow medium and a little bit of titanium white for my snow light color. So the mountain's not completely in light, but I am going to put in... And I'm going to put in the light. Now, back to our rule. See if the shadows do the heavy lifting, the light gets all the credit. Let's just see if that, let's see if that happens here. Ready? One, two, three, let's go. Okay, it's coming in. So all this is in light right there. Okay, we're gonna move on to uh, tip number six here in a second. I just want to, I just want to throw in my light real quick, just so I can see it as it's happening. And I'm deciding that uh, it is gonna be a light and shadow painting. So the sun is likely to disappear again on me. But that's okay. I'm just going to stay cool. I'm gonna stay calm. I'm not gonna worry about it. And I'm gonna stay with this design. So you can see now the contrast of warm and cool, light and shadow, and what I mean about my points here about comparing and contrasting and creating interest in your painting. Point number six is about comparing. All right, if you want your colors to pop on plein air, you gotta get really good at comparing piece to piece, color to color, like color to like color. That's why I talked earlier about those greens. You want to compare your greens to your greens, your purples to your purples, your your lights to your lights and make those adjustments in color value and temperature for each piece accordingly so i said that all pretty quickly but rewind that if you didn't get that because everything i just said i spent years and a lot of money in workshops and learning to get get that information so rewind that if you need to that was kind of important point number six with comparing a color appears what it is only because of its relationship to its surrounding colors you know what i mean you can, you can make a color look different depending on what you surround it by. And I made that point in my color mixing video. Again, if you haven't seen it, go go look at it. We surrounded, uh, I think it was cad red with two different colors. And the cad red looked completely different when it was surrounded by different colors. The color only is what it is because of its relationship to surrounding colors. Okay, so back to point number six here, continuing on. Look at the palette here. I'm gonna mix up uh, some cad yellow light. I'm gonna mix up some green, some phthalo green, and I'm gonna mix up a powerful green light color to go on the light side of the evergreen tree. And we're gonna talk more about how to pop your colors and your trees and everything else in your painting. I'm gonna put a lot on my brush. I'm an impressionist, I'm a painter. I like to use paint. And so I dipped pretty heavy. But to make my point number six, I'm gonna go over here to this tree. I'm not necessarily ready to do this now, but I wanna make the point since I'm on number six here, is basically just ask yourself, okay, what's next to the color that I wanna pop? So if I wanna pop the mountains, what's next to it? You know, so if these are purple, gray, purple colors, my pop would be its complementary color, maybe an orange color, a yellow color in the snow to make those two vibrate off each other. Same in the trees. So I've got green and red. Now watch 
how just putting the light side of this on like this just makes the tree pop. See that? It's because I'm cognizant of the color that's next to it, which is its complementary color, and it's cool. And it's a shadow, and it's dark. So see, that piece right there, that tree, that's how I would make that tree pop like that. And then, again, now that I got that on there, let's look at this. It was in the tree painting video, so I'll just cover it really quickly. Go watch that video. But basically, we've got our light side of the tree. We've got our, our half tone, which is the actual color of the tree itself, the actual green color that, without it being washed out by the sunlight. And then we've got our core, you know, we've got our dark and our core dark on this side of the tree. All right, I just mixed up a uh, mountain snow color that's in shadow. So I used a little bit of, uh, used a little bit of cerulean blue. I think I used some cobalt and some titanium white, and maybe just put a, just a, a hint of some, some red in there just to cool it up, and put it on more of the gray side. Right there, along with point number six here, comparing what's next to it. You see the light in the in the snow. Well, now I'm going to go in and look next to it and put in where it's where the shadow is, so that the two colors can contrast off each other. See that? So now we have light and shadow playing off each other in the snow. This is all under point number six about comparing. So I constantly want to compare my pieces: piece one, piece two, piece three, piece four, and be looking to see if I'm creating depth and interest. It's a nice pretty color, this gray color. I like it. Like I said in that last video, a cool and a warm, a quorum, that kind of dips into some, some warmer colors to put in with that cool snow color. And I come up with a quorum, cool and a warm together. And it, it oftentimes produces a nice, a nice subtle neutral gray color that you can use to your advantage when you want to pop colors. Because once you get that gray color in, I'll talk about it later, but I'll show you how that can help you pop your colors later. I've been using the same brush to get to do the warm and the cool, and that's how I come up with the quorum. But <laughs> now I just want clean, clean color. Titanium white. I'm going to go cad yellow medium, just a touch. But I'm going to get, you know, we'll talk about this with colors later, how to pop your colors, but just get it, get it on the brush nice and clean. Clean brush, clean color. And then right here, Clean my brush with my paper towel after that stroke. Clean it, because I went into the cool colors. I don't want to dip back down again and pick up, you know, dirty color paint. I want clean paint. So, clean paint right here, coming up, right there. See? And that produces a nice little pop right in there. Cool, nice and warm. And the sun's coming from here, so you want to show that in your painting, the light should wash from right to left. So I gotta be careful about my light and my shadow and let it read right. I don't wanna put light in with the shadow, you know? Like we were talking about earlier. Like I said, try to hone your palette knife skills. Don't be afraid of it. It's kinda like a bucking bronco, man. It's not really completely controllable, but that's part of the fun of it. Get those Bob Ross happy accidents going. I don't know why I talk about him so much, but you know, I think what I like about Bob is just that, is that he opened the door for so many people to enjoy painting and he made it fun, you know? But I wanna make it fun like he, like he did, you know? And it is fun. That's why we paint. Enjoy God's beauty and, and have fun. Hey, me again, popping into the video. Hey, I've got a freebie for you. Um, I will link it up in the description, but if you're new to plein air painting and you have questions about gear and setup and supplies, I made a free private unlisted video on how to do plein air setup and supplies. I think it's one of the better ones on YouTube. I spent a lot of time on it. One of the newer ones out there. So I'll link it up in the description, grab it, it's free. And it also gives you access to our, uh, our monthly newsletter for our community. I give tips and techniques between videos on plein air painting to help you become a better plein air painter. Let's get back to the painting. Let's transition 0.6 into 0.7 and you know the last thing I'll say about 0.6 as a bridge to get us there is that it's all about color relationships. It really is. That, that's your job, not to make a masterpiece, but to uh, improve at your color relationships. Uh, the first point that I started out with was it's all about contrast. 
you know, if I were to back it up with something equally important, it would be, uh, it would be that, that uh, it's just getting to be really good at your color relationships. And I'm, I'm still working at it. I'm a long way from where I want to be. But that's what's cool about plein air painting, you know. It's a, it's a journey. And it's a fun journey. And uh, it is don't over model. And what I mean by that is I have four stages to my painting process. The drawing stage, the abstract stage, the forming stage, and the finishing. In the forming stage, you're, you're taking your two-dimensional shape that you had made in your block in, and you're giving, it some, you're giving it some form and some planes and some gradients and just describing the pieces within the big piece. Okay? But you don't want to over-model. You don't, you don't want to beat your painting to death. And that's why I said to myself and to you, don't, don't cover those nice strokes up. If you get some finishing strokes early, even on these trees where I first started, like right in here, I like some of these. If I was a smart painter, I would keep some of those in and not over model it. Because to me, this is kind of special. You know, it, it's, it's not quite finished, but I could get in there and, and just tree leaf it to death and ruin my painting. So be careful of that. I've got a lot of info to cover. I hope you're getting value out of these tips. If you are, hit the like button. But uh, Let's keep cruising here into uh, tip number eight, and that is muted grays, M, muted grays. So another way you can pop your paintings, you know, if, if the sun didn't come out today, what I was going to really rely on was this point right here, that you can, you can use colorful grays when the sun is not out, and you can still pop your paintings. I really want to make that point with you that you don't need the light, the sun, to pop your paintings all the time. You really don't. So one tactic uh, style if you will is and there's various painters out there I've seen do it it's not really my style per se I'm an impressionist I'm a colorist trained in Russian impressionism so I think about value first and color second but I think about color really early on if you know what I mean <laughs> for me it's all about color uh, but but one way to uh, pop your your colors is to do 80 or 90 percent of the painting in these muted in these muted colorful grays and then turn the lights on, if you will, with a nice pop of color to the last 10% of your painting. So, you know, this is a similar analogy would be just like turning a, lighting a candle in a dark room, right? It doesn't take much light for, for that room to light up. And then you can do the same thing in your painting. So, and you know, another way you can do that is, I'd like to do this in one of my future videos and show you how it's done, is to paint with a limited palette. Have you ever done that? Where you just kind of, you know, you keep four, five, six, seven colors on your palette and just paint with that. So that accomplishes the same thing. You're kind of handcuffed, if you will, you know, from your big bright colors. And so you kind of have to rely on, you know, your more, your more colorful grays. Good. Okay, next, uh, let's get that aspen color, aspen tree color right in here, piece number two. Let's just show you how we mixed up that color. And that's going to be titanium white. Put it next to my tree color so I can judge on my palette. Compare, compare. Let's go with a little bit of green. Cad yellow, light. It's a different color green. Can't really describe it, but it does have more red in it. It's a grayish red green. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> so I don't want to overpower it. And I especially don't want to overpower it because it's getting further away from me. So I want to show atmospheric perspective in my in my temperature and my values to show that it's receding that that aspen forest is receding away from me into the distance okay doke well uh this week the uh big family news is daughter kate uh, the one that struggles with anxiety she turned 13 got another two teenagers in the house now so that was the big news on our front excited for her and like i said in a previous video you know she struggles with anxiety and sleep and poor little thing you know she's you know art and uh, drawing continues to to kind of be her refuge so there really is something to i think art uh, does something you know to your, to your brain i think and it really helps her with her anxiety that's why i try to every time i'm out here i try to tell you that one of the reasons i do this is to find some peace you know in my life i started oil painting you know because i had a stressful sales job and i needed something as a refuge to get away from all the stress and started taking lessons at the uh, Art Students League of Denver and didn't look back really, just, just fell in love with it. And she went on a mission trip to Las Vegas. <laughs> 
least I think she did. She might have went to gamble. I gave her a hundred bucks to put on craps just in case. No, I'm kidding. I uh, she she went on a mission trip with YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Great group of people doing some great things, some great work for the Lord and uh, sharing the Bible and, and the good news of Christ uh, to people who really need it. And in this world right now, a lot of people need it. She's a royal pain in the rump sometimes, but but I miss her. <laughs> Okay, let's cruise along here into our next tips. And tip number nine is uh, unity and harmony. So Sergei Bongart, one of the fathers of Russian Impressionism, said that every good painting has a main color that goes through it. And that's kind of something to ponder, something very interesting. In this particular painting today, you know, I think it's probably gonna be green. We got a lot of greens going through it, but keep that in mind as you start your painting, visualize it before you start, visualize it and uh, just see if there's a main color out there that you want that you want to go through the painting. But another way to create harmony in your painting is to bring colors that are in the foreground into the background and bring colors that are in the background into the foreground. Um, just, just find the ones that are, that are there and pay attention and bring them in to the foreground or the background. And that can create some nice harmony in your painting and make your colors pop. Okay, so can you see already how we're starting to get some nice light and shadow? Some nice contrast in the painting. The darks are in the foreground, mid-tones in the, uh, the middle ground, and then lights in, in the background. And you want to use your strongest colors to pop the foreground. So I'm going to save those. I'm going to save the power for the very end here. And that's going to help me show atmospheric perspective, kind of push the mountains. Even though I can reach out and touch those mountains, it seems like, I need to push them back a little bit. And you do that with popping your colors in the foreground and saving pure color for that okay okay here we go ready uh watch this so this is why we do our darkest darks in the foreground ready i'm just dipping into I want you to see my palette here okay i'm going into pure lizard crimson putting it into my tree color to get a nice dark and i want to uh i want to make my mountains pop so the way i do that is i put this dark right here right over the mountain snow, the lightest part. So I've got that contrast, you see? That contrast of light and dark. See, right here in this area? That's interesting. So when you look at this painting after I'm done, your eye will hopefully be led to an area like that. If you wanna see some quick impressionistic painting, watch me go through these trees, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna burn through these. I'm gonna make like 500 trees in, in four and a half minutes. Like I said, my paintings don't look like much until the very end. And even then I can't promise like it'll look like much, but sometimes it comes together, sometimes it doesn't. I have faith, today it's coming together. It's gonna to come together for us. This core dark shadow color of ultramarine blue, right there, that's pretty, just pure. Pure color. I'll try to zoom in for you so you can see that. Not even really mixing it. Just letting happy accidents happen at this point. I'm in a hurry. I gotta I gotta kind of rush toward finish. So I'm just going quick. But it's helping me because I'm seeing some beautiful colors in here that are uh, bouncing off each other. It's really helping me right now. Sometimes you know you can be too pretty, too careful. I don't want to get so attached to this thing where you're out here trying to make a masterpiece. I mean Number one, have some fun, man. Loosen up. And number two, experiment. Don't stress about it. There is a structure. There is a formula. There are steps you can follow. You can do this. Okay, for these, the light side of the trees, I'm mixing some titanium white, caddiella medium, yellow ochre. And I'll use various warms. I'll use reds, oranges, and yellows. I'll use everything I got, and depending on what I see out there. Uh, right now... I'm not seeing that brilliant pop, you know, because the sun's behind the clouds. So I'm gonna wait for it and hope it comes so I can show you. So I'm going in, I'm gonna use more cad yellow, medium, and then blue, right? So I make my greens mostly uh, with blue and yellow and various blues and yellows to make my greens. And that's what I'm doing right now. A little yellow ochre, okay. And a touch of cad orange. That'll warm up that green. That'll give me a nice warm green color. Let's put it on, see what we got. Just, uh, I've been using liquid impasto medium and uh, I'm gonna put some more of that out on the palette right now. It helps with drying time and just gives me that buttery a la prima look to my painting, nice and thick that I like. 
use it in the later stages. And uh, by the way, you can uh, look down at my links. I have affiliate links through dickblick.com and Utrecht paints. I use a lot of Utrecht paints, some Windsor & Newton, gambling paints. I no extra charge to you. You can order the stuff that I use. All right, I'm starting to pop some light on here. Here we go, just using a big number 12, my Raphael big number 12 brush. And I'm really just, I'm painting the light on the tree, okay? I'm not, I'm not telling myself that I'm painting a tree because I'll get myself into trouble if I do that. So see how your, your mind can be convinced that I'm painting a tree and really all I'm doing is just putting down a couple brush strokes, that's all I'm doing. Use some energetic, passionate brush strokes at this point, you know? Get excited, man, this is fun. Put some paint on, have some fun. Paint the light. I'm just going quick. We kind of lit up the forest and I didn't use my most powerful, I didn't use my most powerful colors yet. So yeah, if you want your colors to pop, use some pure color. An example of that right now, cause actually it's good timing. The sun just blared out almost full strength over some of these trees on this side of the forest. So here we go. Let's dip into pure cad yellow. Put it in my green mixture. And let's mix that with pure cad medium. And slowly, I'll get over here so you can see, just let that hit the tree in certain spots like this. This is the washout color. This is that part of the tree that receives full blare light and it's washed out. That's what I'm putting on there right now. And you can do that through quick energetic strokes like that or that or a little more subtly and just let the, just let your brush kind of dab down and just follow some of those pine cones that you see or whatever is on the end of those trees that's catching the light like that. Don't want to be a, a leaf painter, but uh, but you can do that. All right, right here, I'm gonna go pure, pure color, just thick brush stroke right there. Another one there, another one there. Okay, here we go. I'm just gonna dip into pure cad yellow on my palette right there. And I'm purposely gonna put it next to the dark, like I talked about earlier. These are just kind of shrubs, trees growing up, but not too much, not too much of it. Just purposefully looking to create contrast and interest next to the darks. See that right there? I like it. Let's keep rolling. The light on the trees over here is a little more muted. So I'm just gonna show that. Not everything's about popping popping the whole painting. You gotta be selective about it. Okay, so this is kind of like, you know, when you're driving at night and somebody's headlights hit you and you're like, whoa, man, turn those things down. You don't wanna turn up your painting full blast and make everything just, I mean, you can, you can do anything you want in art. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you can create more interesting contrast by leaving some neutral grays, some really dark darks, and just selectively popping your colors where appropriate. So another way of saying that is that a good painting has a main color going through it, but also a good painting, every good painting has some quiet areas. Every part of the painting should be interesting, you know, says Sergei Bongart, expert Russian impressionist, but there's got to be like quiet areas and noisy areas. This is my noisy area. That's where I'm screaming. Hey, look at me. This is interesting. Check it out. This is more my quiet area. Like, okay, take a little break with your eyes. And let's go back to the mountain now. That's how you can lead your viewer's eye through the painting. This is where we're uh, bringing on the kind of those full, full power colors, you know, that we were talking about. As you get close to the end of a painting, you're looking to put in your darkest dark and your lightest light. And why do you think that is? because it creates contrast, that's right. And you may have lost your, your darkest dark and your lightest light, you know, just trying to uh, accomplish what you're accomplishing. Okay, so point number 11, if you want to pop your colors, try using some more paint. I kind of alluded that 
earlier, but if you're somebody who's a little bit shy, you know, about loading up your brush, uh, just experiment, you know, and use more paint. That can help pop your colors. When you have, you know, Claude Monet used to do that. Um, I did a video about Claude Monet, and he used to paint thick because he realized that when the light hits your thick paint, it creates little light and dark areas and little nuances that create interest in the mind's eye. Like my teacher always used to say, paint like a rich man or a rich lady. Load your paint up, man. Load your brush up. You're a painter. If you like impressionism. And then I need to kind of take some purples that are back here and put them in, put them in like I, like I told you in the foreground. And so I'll just do that right now, just real quick. To cool off the oranges. I'm satisfying your subconscious mind and you don't even know it. <laughs> You know, tip number 12 here would be to uh, to use a palette knife. And that can really help your, your colors pop too, because what you wanna do is use it to mix your colors. Um, instead of, you know, sometimes you're in a hurry and you have to dip, you have to dip your colors and get going like you saw me doing earlier. But if you want good, clean colors, um, use your palette knife to mix up your colors, wipe it after you mix it, and then get another clean color. And that can help keep your colors clean. And then do that with your brush too after you lay in a color, clean your brush real quick with your, with your uh, whatever you use. Keep clean, clean color mixing skills going on. Okay, let's take a look at what we got here. Palette got pretty messy. Purposely didn't tell you my colors today just because it's really not about what kind of colors you use. It's really about your technique and the 12 tips that I'd outlined for you. We got pretty thick toward the end as usual, but Check out those trees where we did the different colors, you know, the half tone, the highlight, the core dark. Felt like we ran out of, I ran out of time today, you know, I just might want to put some finishing touches on this in the studio. Especially the sky up there, I think you can see it's a little bit unfinished. You can see that we're making our colors pop here. I like it. All right, this is the four P's of the drawing stage. If you've made it this far, congratulations. You're hungry. You're a go-getter. You're going to be a successful planner or painter, I can tell. Okay, the four P's of the drawing stage. What I've done here, as you can see in the time lapse, is the first P is pieces. I divide the complex landscape up into four, three to five manageable pieces. You know, if I look out there, it's too confusing. Shadows and rocks and trees, and uh, it can overwhelm you. So piece number one is going to be this whole mountain range here. Piece number two is going to be the, the aspen forest uh, that has so nicely turned to green here in the last week or two, right here going up the mountain. I put it in green so you can see it. Piece number two. Piece number three is the evergreen forest right here in front of me, about 50 yards in front of me, right here. Piece number four is the foreground closest to me right here, and there's a bunch of shrubs and trees and some nice green colors in there as well. All right, going on to the second P, placement. When you're doing your drawing, before you get started it, it's a very crucial foundational part of your your painting uh, make sure that you place everything in its proper boundary so you can't you can't not have a plan and know where things are going to be they have to be placed properly and in, within their boundary so i know that the aspen forest goes here i know that the evergreen forest goes here my foreground is only going to take up this boundary right here so you can't just start painting haphazardly i guess you could there's no rules in art uh, but if you want it to look like the scene you got to have your placement correct pieces placement proportion so you want to make sure that everything is proportionately sized accurately with room for artistic license you know you're the artist you can do what you want but um, I don't want to make you know if I want this to be portrayed as I see it here I don't want to make these trees you know too tall that they go up to the top of the mountain for example so proportion of everything should be sized pretty close to where it's supposed to be Pieces, placement, proportion, and perspective. Whenever you have a plein air painting, you want to be able to try to show perspective if you can. With, uh, you know, we did a video a couple weeks ago, watch that one if you haven't seen it on perspective. If you have a street scene like I did, you want to show perspective with the buildings, a railroad track, a road. In today's painting, uh, there's not too much of a chance to show linear perspective because I'm looking straight on at this mountain range, but I'm gonna be able to show atmospheric perspective a little bit. And as you, if you watch that video, you'll know that that's done through changes in, in temperature and color and value. All right, all right, the four Ps of the drawing stage, let's get on to painting and our block in.
Oh yeah. Make sure you uh, check out this next video right up here on how to see and mix colors on plein air. I really think that'll help you pop your colors and uh, advance your plein air color mixing skills as well. Uh, hey, you can do this. Have fun. God bless. We'll see you over there in the next video. Take care.